I'd like to welcome everyone from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And my name is John Osana. I'd like to welcome you to our webinar series held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Adaptation Science Center. And today's webinar is titled, Linking Remote Sensing and Bird Behavior Data to Understand the Impacts of Drought on Waterfowl. And we're excited to have Michael Casaza with us today. And Michael is from the USGS. Uh, we have Abby Lynch who is also with the U.S. Geological Survey, and she will be introducing our speaker today. Abby? Thanks. Um, thanks for the opportunity. I'm with the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center, and it's my pleasure to introduce Michael Casaza. And um, just as a brief introduction to him and his team, which includes Corey Overton and Elliot Machette, there are wildlife biologists at the USGS Western Ecological Research Center in Dixon, California. Um, they and others conduct a variety of research on the ecology, population biology, disease, and habitats of wildlife in California and Western North America. The team's research provides species information to land managers responsible for maintaining diverse and healthy wildlife populations while trying to help recover special status species. A primary focus of their work includes the study of waterfowl movement across multiple species using cutting edge tracking devices. This research is being used to understand waterfowl migra migration, movement patterns, distribution, and habitat use, which can inform management from the local to the flyway level. We're looking forward to your presentation today, Mike. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and the opportunity to, to share some of our, our research with you guys, with, with everyone. Um, uh, and I'd just like to, you know, acknowledge my co-authors, also uh, Josh Ackerman and, and Susan Dela Cruz of, of the uh, USGS and Matt Ryder, who is uh, really uh, kind of the architect behind a lot of the water mapping products that you're going to see in the presentation. And he's with uh, Point Blue Conservation Science. So, um, yeah, and I just, uh, just in general, um, uh, just a, a couple of brief descriptions about the project before we get kind of get into the details. Um, the opportunity really was w w that we're taking advantage of is we had these two uh, kind of distinct projects at the time going on where Point Blue and, and their and some other partners were mapping uh, water uh, um, flooded habitats across the landscape and in the Central Valley. And then we were doing this, uh, in, in, involved in this intense radio telemetry work um, using these new transmitters on, on multiple species of waterfowl. And um, we, we uh, kind of partnered with the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center to, um, to kind of try and integrate those, those two ongoing projects and, and basically leverage that work. Um, and with a little bit of funding from the, from the uh, Science Center, uh, we were able to, um, you know, just uh, try and um, maximize what we're get, what each project is getting out of um, the data set. So, uh, from the from the mapping aspect, um, just being able to see how evaluate how well does uh, the water mapping really relate to waterfowl habitat, and from the from the telemetry aspect, we were really looking forward to seeing, you know, how how does this water map help us interpret the birds' behavior and how how they respond. To water on the um, on the landscape, and and it's really um, those are kind of both critical things to have uh, to be able to know when you want to evaluate something like drought, and especially in California, right when we were doing this project, we were starting in the in the middle of a pretty extreme drought situation, so the timing was great, and we really appreciate the support from everybody. Um, and just a little bit about the Central Valley. Uh, the Central Valley um, of California is um, a critical uh, wintering area for waterfowl in the Pacific Flyway, um, with up to 12 million waterfowl spending some portion of their um, their winter uh, uh, time period here. Uh, over 85 different species of water birds, um, and and the mix of the landscape is really it's a mix of private lands, um, uh, agriculture, uh, duck clubs. Um, Provide about providing about 85% of the of the current habitat. Um, the Central Valley Habitat Joint Venture or Joint Venture uh, with Fish and Wildlife Service uh, led is really a, a great private public conser um, conservation um, team that is um, 
dedicated to uh, um, maintaining waterfowl and water bird populations throughout the, the Central Valley. Um, and it's really important given that only 10% of uh, historic wetlands are remaining in this area and it's, we're in a highly uh, urbanized and um, agricultural landscape um, with rem remnant and fragmented um, areas of wetlands. Um, and California water is, uh, water is, the, is the real gold. Um, it's really the currency that drives our state. Um, and this is just a, a slide that, that kind of demonstrates where that water is distributed on the landscape, how, it, how it's kind of doled out under current, uh, this is from a 2011 publication, um, where you see the cities are getting about uh, 15, 16 percent of the water uh, available. Farms are, are and farms and industry are, are up there in the 60 to, 60 to 65 percent. Uh, fish and flows, somewhere around 20 percent and waterfowl, uh, somewhat meager, 2% of the water allocation in the state is, is kind of going to support waterfowl-related habitats. And so when we look at those numbers, we think it's, it's really critical that we do the best we can managing that small amount of water available to, to uh, support 12 million uh, water birds. And so uh, the water tracker product is really developed, uh, and it's a, a kind of a product that uh, Point Blue has has, and Matt have, have developed, which um, really just maps the probability of surface water using Landsat imagery. And uh, Landsat's uh, basically on a 16-day cycle, so they try and they uh, basically integrate the, uh, the imagery um, uh, every two weeks and get a water map of surface, surface water uh, across the entire Central Valley or most, most of the Central Valley. Um, every two weeks, and they've been able to do that going back with historic imagery, um, and uh, we particularly are focusing on, on data from 2013 to present. Um, one of the things you can do when you have a map of water uh, across time and space, you can and kind of assess the impacts of, of drought on um, various uh, habitat types. And here we're just looking at the types that we, you know, that are important to waterfowl, uh, especially dabbling ducks that, that we have um, uh, with radio transmitters. So that on the agricultural side, you have corn and rice. Um, which uh, you know are, are contribute a lot to uh, to waterfowl habitat in the region, and what we see is that yes, during uh, severe drought the, in the in kind of the pinkish uh, salmon color, um, grab you see uh, some pretty serious declines in the proportion of, of flooded corn and rice uh, during drought periods, and you see a similar um, response looking at the water tracker and how it m mapping surface water of flooded uh, seasonal marshes and semi-permanent marshes during those periods of extreme drought as well. So the water tracker is, it seems to be doing a good job of tr tracking these types of habitats during the, uh, during uh, various periods of normal to, to drought uh, in California. Um, another um, uh, kind of uh, thing, area where we wanted to investigate was just uh, how drought affected um, the acres of rice planted. And so we, uh, we looked up some USDA crop data and basically um, uh, indicated through that data that uh, you, you see about a 20 to 25 percent reduction in or following of, of rice during uh, these ex this extreme periods of drought. Now the drought started a little early on the, on the graph there, but um, you know it takes a few years of drought in California before water supplies are diminished and and the allocations for rice farmers are dropped down to the, where it actually impacts the uh, acres planted. And uh, so this, this can affect the, the habitat on the landscape. And given that a, a big portion of the Central Valley habitat available for waterfowl is agriculture and in the Sacramento Valley, um, you know, some, uh, somewhere normally in a normal year, about 550,000 acres of rice, which a significant portion of that gets flooded, uh, it's important to, to, to know that um, impact of drought on that as well. And then um, we looked at the water tracker is how well it, it, it kind of maps um, uh, different uh, habitats or dur during uh, different years. And basically uh, it, it matched up really well where um, you see the proportion of open water um, higher during the um, non-drought years 
the drought you're slightly less, and then in extreme drought, um, quite a bit less. So the the, habit, the water tracker seems to be doing a good job of capturing, um, you know, what we would expect based on precipitation. Um, another feature of the water tracker that we think is really, um, uh, really quite useful and maybe not as intuitive is uh, the ability to detect irrigations on the landscape. And with some previous work through some uh, uh, UC Davis, uh, John Eady and some of his students there, um, they looked at the impact of irrigating um, seasonal uh, moist soil managed uh, seasonal wetlands and the, and the impact of irrigation on the productivity of those wetlands. And what they found was the, you know, one or two irrigations produced significantly greater uh, yield of uh, moist soil seed. And, and so we could use the water tracker um, to, and Point Blue did, to evaluate um, the probability of, um, uh, of uh, wetland irrigation in various regions within the, in the Sacramento Valley um, based on, on drought. And what they found was during drought, the probability was lower, uh, particularly in some areas. I think where water supplies became more limited and perhaps groundwater um, is not, was not available. So, um, so what this can, this can do is you can map where those irrigations are taking place and you can sort of estimate okay, you know, that you're, you're, the joint venture is using some estimates of um, production and food availability. And those estimates could be modified based on the water trackers uh, indexing of those irrigations and we get a better idea of, um, you know, food abundance across the landscape. Um, and which kind of plays into, this is just a couple of different scenarios. These are um, just sort of a, the basic uh, A scenario is where your food supply, the red curve, um, is uh, 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 very sufficient and um, well above the demand curve below in blue. And so you have basically uh, lots of food in supply um, over the course of the winter and, and demand does not exceed supply. And that's, that's what you kind of want to see. That's the goal of the joint venture and the ha habitat uh, plan is to, to have that food curve in that condition. And, and, um, and then the scenario B is sort of is uh, potentially uh, depicting what you would maybe expect in a, in a drought condition where you have at the beginning potentially um, you know, an adequate food supply, but as, um, as the winter bears on, the demand um, increases and you reach a period of uh, food deficit where the red line and blue line intersect and your demand is exceeding your um, supply and the birds have to do something, either leave, go find some other areas to feed, or uh, perhaps just um, are impacted in terms of their body condition. And there's several studies that show that the body condition of uh, waterfowl leaving the, the wintering area is directly related to reproductive output on the breeding ground. So um, there's some potential impacts that, that you could see with that. Um, and here, just some, this is um, uh, some work done. Um, this is actually a paper from uh, Mark Petrie and the joint venture where they actually looked at and modeled some uh, um, real data in, in, in terms of the TrueMet model. And when you focus in on that, that purple line is under the drought conditions, um, and this is just for, for ducks, um, that under drought conditions for ducks, they predicted that towards the end of um, December, early January, that we actually could reach a, a deficit and, um, and you would actually have these, um, uh, this, this condition would be in play. Uh, under under certain you know severe drought conditions, and we, we look at that same the same modeling effort for geese, and we see that there is a deficit, but it um, it occurs much later, and um, and really this comes into play with the feeding behavior of, of differences between ducks and geese, whereas ducks will um, primarily just are feeding in flooded habitats, whereas geese will take advantage of both flooded and dry habitats, and so um, they have the ability to ex exploit habitat in the drought that, um, that ducks might not, but still under drought conditions would be facing a potential deficit late in the winter period. Um, so that's kind of, uh, you know, just an example of how we would use the water tracker information to try and relate it to, to um, what's going on in the landscape and what we think is going on with birds. But then we wanted to see, well, you know, will we have actual data on these birds and, and what they're doing in, in relationship to that water on the landscape? 
And so, um, uh, so we combine that. So we have these uh, solar-powered backpack GPS transmitters, and they just fit on like a backpack. Uh, and uh, we have about approximately 550 uh, different individuals, uh, seven different species marked. Um, and the transmitters can collect data. Actually, this is a little bit old slide that from anywhere from a one-minute interval to a six-hour interval. Um, so you know, one minute would be basically getting a location every minute for the day. Um, they can't do that for for uh, more than 24, uh, 36 hours. They use up their charge, but uh, they are solar powered, so they will recharge. And so we can get in, um, these varying, uh, really high frequency uh, relocation data with an accuracy of a normal handheld GPS, somewhere around five to 10 meters, and sometimes uh, sometimes a lot better. Um, and to date, we have uh, you know well over 650,000 data points. Um, that we can that we can apply to these different questions and evaluation of the of the water tracker, um, and we're also doing um, the pr primarily um, the data I'm presenting today is from the water, from the ducks, but we all are also marking uh, geese, and we'll be looking at how they're using dry uh, and wet habitats going forward. So, um, and they basically have the same type of transmitter. The transmitter communicates through the cell phone network through the GSM network. So it's, uh, as long as it's in cell phone range, we're getting the data, and when it's not, it stores the data on board and will download the data. And uh, currently we're getting lots of uh, data from migrating geese coming back from the Arctic, and they're downloading uh, ma uh, you know, many, many megabytes of data uh, every day um, from the storage on board the uh, transmitter. And for the geese, we have several species marked as well, lesser snows, Ross, uh, greater white fronts, as well as uh, tule white fronted geese now as well. And so for the, just, um, for the Central Valley, just as uh, we already talked about its importance in the Pacific Flyway as a major wintering area for up to 12 million birds, but just wanted to, most of the birds, almost all the birds that we've marked have been in the Central Valley, in particular primarily in Sassoon Marsh, which is right on the, the, uh, the edge of the Central Valley. And you can see from some of these, this is an example of some of the locations that we've um, uh, gotten from the birds that we've released. They, you know, the, pretty much the Central Valley is blacked out there or yellowed out um, with the, you know, a myriad of thousands and thousands of points. But the birds spread out all across North America. We've even had interchange between different flyways, and um, and now with the geese that we're marking, many are going into uh, in, into Russia. So, um, you know, just the the importance of the Central Valley really can't be um, overstated. Uh, it's uh, it's a real critical area for the whole, for all of North America, and um, and uh, so uh, you know, being able to track the water and the birds within the Central Valley, uh, we feel is just a, it's a kind of a game changer for some of the management questions that, that are being put forward. Um, so our primary study area in the Central Valley, and that's just it's got the, our, some of our bird locations, our duck locations overlaid there. Uh, you can see the Sassoon Marsh is kind of on that western edge. Just it's at the confluence of the um, Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers as they flow into the San Francisco Bay uh, estuary. Um, uh, the the habitats associated with the Central Valley um, in the in the Sacramento Valley. If you look at the figure on the left, the Sacramento Valley to the north um, of, of the of the Central Valley. Primarily, uh, you know, the, the bird habitat would be primarily com consisting of wetlands and rice agriculture. And with the wetlands in blue and the rice agriculture in green, a little bit of corn and, and other habitats mixed in, but primarily that's kind of the rice belt up in the north. The San Joaquin um, River Delta, the Sacramento San Joaquin River Delta, uh, a lot of corn, a little bit of rice and wetlands, but primarily kind of a corn-centric uh, area. Uh, the Sassoon Marsh um, a wetland, uh, almost you know, almost all wetlands, either mostly seasonal wetlands, uh, with a little bit of uh, tidal wetlands as well. And then the San Joaquin Valley to the south, um, primarily the primary bird habitats are the wetland units down there. Agriculture in the San Joaquin Valley has kind of shifted over the past 30 years, where you see a shift away from any kind of rice or grain crops to uh, uh, nut nut crops, uh, almonds, um, vineyards, and uh, and cotton. So um, really, depending on those wetland um, those uh, wetlands down in the south, either duck clubs or, or uh, refuge areas. 
Um, and then on the figure on the right, when you overlay the bird locations on the habitat, they really actually line up pretty well. Um, and, and what the birds are focusing in on, these are duck locations, and they're focusing in on the, those same habitats when they're flooded. So uh, as those habitats flood and, and drain, and they become available uh, when they flood to, to, to ducks, the ducks respond, and we see a really nice overlap of obviously bird use right over top of those wetland and agricultural habitats. Um, and so to give you an example, here's, uh, we have uh, different species in different colors, and um, we uh, just, um, these are 20-day uh, intervals just of the bird locations through, over the course of the winter, and you can, you know, essentially that breaks down the previous slide you saw with all those points, and you can see how the various species distribute themselves over the winter, and we really get a, a really nice mix of uh, locations and distribution of, of waterfowl across the, the Central Valley, especially in the Sacramento Valley. Um, let's see. And then that, that's at the, uh, at, the, um, at the more regional scale when we're focusing in here. Uh, the bottom right of, of the picture there is the Sutter Buttes, if, if you're familiar with the Sacramento Valley at all. This is Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge here. And um, we can look at the bird points at the more regional level and then look at the distribution. The, pretty much most of the green uh, habitat that you see surrounding the, the refuge or the Sutter Buttes, which we shouldn't see too many duck points up there, uh, but the green is, is primarily rice agriculture. Um, uh, and we can see a little more local, regional scale, bird movement across um, time and space over the winter. Again, 20-day intervals of distribution of points. And they're really using that entire landscape, um, but the primary driver of whether they're using it is whether there's flooding there or not. And then um, to take it down, uh, just kind of um, down a, a notch in scale again, this is just, this is just an example of one bird. Um, it was marked, it was, a, it was a northern pintail marked in the Sassoon Marsh down in the the southern part of the, uh, uh, or in the central part of the, the Central Valley. And it, you can, uh, this actually it does a good job of depicting uh, many of the birds that we have marked in, in kind of their, their behavior. They tend to, of course, in the wintertime, uh, there's a hunting season going on, they tend to congregate with their daytime locations at some uh, sanctuary area. And then uh, at night, the, um, they go out and feed and they'll um, distribute themselves from those sanctuary areas. And so you can see this bird is in Sassoon, probably uh, using a couple of different sanctuary areas and then feeding off into the, into the duck clubs around it. And then it moves into um, the lower, into the Yolo Bypass area in the Central Valley there, um, just south of Sacramento, and um, does the same thing. It, it sets up on a sanctuary during the day and then goes out into the adjacent rice fields and duck clubs and, and feeds and then does that in a couple of other spots um, uh, over in the American Basin and then up around some of the refuges up to the North Sac Refuge and Delavan Refuge, it looks like there. So, so that's just kind of a typical uh, ed example of at the, the, that's the entire winter scale. There's lots of points overlaid on top of one another there. But um, gives you a feel for what the, an individual duck is doing in the Central Valley and, and what it's looking for and the kind of, um, uh, you know, on a daily basis, um, well, I'm going to get to that here. I'm going to show you. On a daily basis, we're, this is a, a basically locations from a couple of days for that, uh, for an individual pintail again. This is in Sassoon Marsh. Uh, and it's really, you know, primarily spending its day on this. Uh, this is a sanctuary in the, uh, on uh, Joyce Island there in the south part of this, the screen. And then, uh, feeding out in the, in the private duck clubs uh, at night um, and, um, and, and utilizing those, those wetland habitats there during the nighttime. And really um, doing that over and over again, uh, day after day, until it moves to a new area, kind of sets up, follows that similar pattern um, in, in a new area. And, um, and then just to get even into a little, even more detail, this is a nighttime feeding track of a radio mark northern pintail. Um, uh, with GPA, GPS locations at two-minute intervals. And, uh, you know, to me, I, every time I look at this, it's just, uh, it, it's a huge game-changer. 
Um, we, when we first started doing uh, telemetry on, on pintails, this was back in the, in the late 80s uh, in, in this region in, in Sassoon Marsh, we, we would take, uh, we would be lucky to get one, maybe two locations in a, on any given bird for any given day. And you'd have to get within about a kilometer of the bird to triangulate it um, from a couple of different, three different spots. And it was very, very labor intensive. And, to, and the point had an accuracy of, you know, two or 300 meters uh, linear distance from, from wherever you determined it was. And so uh, the level of, and the amount of data is somewhat staggering that we can gather now. This is uh, about an eight hour period. We got locations every two minutes and you can follow the bird as it flies in at night uh, in, into this duck club and starts feeding here in this very localized area, probably about maybe a 15 meter radius at that spot right there, and then heads over to an adjacent duck club and, and feeds in a couple, of, uh, a couple of spots there as well. And it just opens up a whole, um, the ability for us to, to go out and, and, and do uh, uh, a lot more reconnaissance and get a much greater understanding of how the birds are using the actual specific uh, the vegetation types, the habitat types, the water depths, all those things at that very local scale. So the telemetry data is giving us data at the, from the regional, the, the, the valley-wide, all the way down, or actually the, the, the continent-wide scale, all the way down to the, um, you know, almost sub-meter scale. And, and so we, we can combine those two, the water tracking and the telemetry data to start to try and address questions like uh, California's winter waterfowl habitat, you know, and one question is, is it drought proof? Uh, we would sure like it to be drought proof. We'd love to be able to say that, you know, we can sustain a, a uh, the waterfowl can sustain their populations given periods of drought, which we expect to occur. And we, when we look at that in uh, some previous analysis, we looked at um, uh, joint venture, uh, pre-joint venture um, conditions we looked at, uh, at uh, habitat during those conditions, and then post joint venture, and then, and then also during drought. And what we see is um, pre-joint venture projects and a lot of restoration efforts and the work that's gone on, um, we see that uh, you know, um, there was a, 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 you know, almost just about half as much as managed wetlands available flooded for, um, for uh, waterfowl and a little bit of flooded rice and a lot of burned rice, which if it wasn't flooded, wasn't really accessible to the ducks. And then post joint venture, you have both an inc inc uh, uh, increase in managed wetlands and you also have an increase in fl flooded rice because that lack of burning uh, led to uh, straw management for the rice fields by, by actually incorporating into the soil and, and, uh, and flooding. And so it really is kind of a boon to waterfowl, um, the management of the straw in, in terms of, in terms of uh, more flooded rice available. Um, and then during drought, what do, we, what do we see? Well, we see some reduction in managed wetlands, but still, um, uh, you know, maintaining uh, a, a, a decent level. What we do is see a significant reduction in the amount of flooded rice available. So, so there's still, um, you know, the, the question of whether we're drought proof or not, I, I think uh, we're, we're not there. We're not there yet, but we're, we're maybe moving in that direction, but we can still keep evaluating that. And then we want to look at how um, the uh, uh, winter precipitation and how it gets tracked by the water tracker and what that looks like and what, um, what it means. Does it all make sense in terms of interpreting our waterfowl data? And so this, we just pulled this, in, this example in. The left panel, the 2016 to 17, uh, winter uh, in October, we got a, we got an a, a amazing amount of rain. We had I think about four inches of rain in October, which is unusual for for us here. It's usually very dry, and um, and then and you can see the 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 light colored green is basically a normal rainfall year, and the, anything in dark green would be uh, when you're above um, uh, normal normal rainfall. And then in 2017-18, the light colored green is there's the, there's the uh, flooding map of depicting the, what was the, the rainfall. So we had that early rainfall event in October, and um, what we have here is just uh, uh, kind of uh, the, the water map from uh, satellite imagery depicting that, that, um, 
that increased rainfall in October of 16, as opposed to kind of the normal pattern of flood up in October of 17, which is our, kind of our normal dry uh, fall, fall um, and most of the flooding there is due to management, as opposed to on the left where you have a combination of management and rainfall uh, to provide a much more wet landscape for, for the waterfowl. So, and that's a, that's a satellite derived image. It's, it's, uh, very, it's the, basically an example of what the water tracker spits out. Um, uh, it's a slightly different, different uh, image, but it's the same, same idea. And we just use it as an example. And we can sort of look at that across time and space. And you can see the, um, the satellite imagery provides you the opportunity to map this water across the landscape. And, and really, you can see, like in the October image that we just talked about, you can see uh, the difference in, in, the, in the regions. And that's primarily like you would, we would uh, assess based on precipitation. Um, December is uh, sometimes a, a peak time of flooding uh, and flooded habitats throughout our landscape, but you can still see differences between years and some of that uh, is due to management, some of it's due to precipitation um, and uh, you can, the satellite actually, um, the, the imagery and the water tracker uh, does a good job of picking out, um, you know, both rainfall and management related water availability on the landscape. So one of the key things we wanted to look at was the performance of the final map um, that uh, the water tracker put out for flooded, ha for flooded habitats. Uh, and, um, and, it, and in general, it performed pretty well. And we expect almost all, almost 100% of our duck locations to come up as, as being within flooded habitat. And when we intersected the points directly with the, uh, with the uh, open water habitats classified by um, water tracker, we got about 75% overall but among, across all species. And, um, and we thought, well, that, you know, we were pretty happy with that. We thought that was pretty good. But then we realized, you know, a lot of our birds are, you know, perhaps on the edge of ponds associated. Some, some species tend to be in much smaller water bodies like mallards maybe like to they use a lot of ditch habitat, a lot of linear habitats that may not show up that well on the water tracker. And so we thought, well, um, it's doing a, a good job, but if we can do a couple of iterations and take the, the, uh, the uh, pixels identified as water with water tracker and, and, and run a couple of uh, uh, tweaks to the iterations on those, uh, maybe we could do a little better. So the first thing we did was just say, okay, well, uh, if it's um, within 100 meters of water, uh, we'll, we'll buffer, we'll buffer any, anything classified by water trackers water and buffer by 100 meters and then see how that does. And that did really great. It got about 90% of our, over 90% of our birds showed up as being in flooded habitat, uh, which made you know, a lot of sense, except that it overclassified things. And really, we, at, at some point, we were getting anywhere between 5 and 85% of the habitat in the Central Valley as coming up as flooded. And uh, it's kind of, and then what we found was what, what really was happening was that there was a lot of very small pixels or you know, a couple, two or three pixels um, that would be classified as uh, open water habitats. But that really um, um, was more of an artifact of just interpreting satellite imagery. And we did another iteration where we kind of uh, um, did a buffering, but then we actually shrunk it back down. If it wasn't uh, if it wasn't more than about a hectare of wetland, we shrunk shrunk it back down to uh, to zero. And really, that's where you know it was a pretty simple iteration, and we were able to capture about 87% of our points um, would be classified in or would be classified in waterfowl habitat using the um, the water tracker uh, output. And with a range of between two and 46 percent flooded in the valley at any one time, and it, that made a lot more sense. It just uh, got rid of a lot of extra water that was kind of an artifact of just these little uh, isolated pixels. And so we're really happy with that. But then we we also thought, well, bird biology comes into play here, and certain species should be a much better tracked by um, open water flooded habitats than others. And so. Um, we, we looked at each individual species, and what we found was, sure enough, um, mallards, uh, kind of a ubiquitous duck that pretty much most people are familiar with, uh, 
use a lot of different habitats. A lot of uh, they like a lot of emergent marsh that doesn't wouldn't maybe necessarily classify at all as as open water habitat. And only 76% of the time were, were they classified in the habitat, and uh, which is not unexpected um, because this is really mapping like these open more open water habitats. And the open water species like northern pintail, shoveler, northern shoveler, and gadwall, uh, blue wing teal. Those species really came up strong and, and really did a great job of, of capturing the, the habitats that those species were using. So the water tracker really kind of was really in concert with um, in, our, in our iteration that we did to, to produce our new habitat map from the water tracker was, um, you know, we were pretty confident that it was really actually quite good at predicting waterfowl habitat. And then when we look at the distance um, that birds fly um, from, from roost to feed, I talked about that briefly with the, the one pintail showing that example of them, you know, basically spreading out from roost areas and, and going out to feed. Um, well, we looked at this in particular over um, different periods of the winter uh, and different years uh, to try and assess, well, do we see differences across seasons and across uh, years and, uh, you know, with varying levels of, of um, of water availability on the landscape. And uh, there's a couple of things that, that kind of stood out. Uh, Sassoon stood out as being kind of the odd, odd uh, place out, maybe, uh, you know, in essence, maybe more drought proof because Sassoon has a really reliable water supply. It's, the, it's, the, it's a tidal area, it's an estuary. Water's, uh, you know, fresh and it's the salinity waxes and wanes through the course of the winter depending on, uh, on uh, uh, freshwater inputs. Um, and so you have this, the, pretty much the footprint of flooded habitats in Sassoon is very stable from year to year. And so the distances that the birds travel, the, the graph on the left, very stable between year to year uh, and between time period to time period. Whereas the, the, uh, the rest of California, the Central Valley, outside of Sassoon Marsh, we see a little bit more variability and we see, um, uh, and I'll just focus in a little bit here. So there you see um, uh, in Sassoon, you see that there's just a, there's a moderate increase in distance from roost just in one of the time periods. It's in the, the um, late season time, um, late season during the drought of 15-16. So we just see a, that one, you know, I wouldn't call it a significant change in, in um, uh, light distances, but it, there's something a little bit different about that and it was during the drought. Um, of 2015-16. But in the Sacramento Valley and outside of Sassoon Marsh, we do see some, you know, some pretty interesting patterns. Um, the, the decreased distance during the early season uh, of 2017-18, we had a lot of water on the landscape. It translated into birds flying less. They had more choices, most likely, uh, within that uh, landscape to choose from and didn't fly as far from their uh, roost uh, to feed. And then in the drought period of mid-season of 15 and 16, you see the bottom line, the orange line, you see the exact opposite, a lot farther distances uh, flown um, from roost to feed. And so, and, and, and kind of that, that general trend. So we do see evidence for that. And why is that important? Why is that flight distance important? Well, it, we just think it translates into a couple things, it, it, both um, impacts for survival and, and, and energetics and reproduction. The, the, farther they have to fly, the more they're looking around for food, the more energy they're expending um, to, to get that. And then in addition to that, the, the farther they fly from roost, potentially uh, could it, um, uh, and we're, we're going to be looking at this too, is um, uh, likely uh, has some survival implications, more exposure to predation or uh, hunting pressure. So really um, trying to minimize those flight distances is a good thing and, and it looks like um, they are related to the distribution of water on the landscape. And uh, we go back to our supply demand curves um, for food and um, and so that's where that would come into play. If you've got that drought period and you, you have um, uh, basically what we talked about in, that, in the, the bottom the scenario B, you could be looking at uh, a drought where you've had fewer irrigations, the quality of your uh, wetland foods is lower, so, so not only and you have less habitat on the landscape, uh, and then and, and now uh, we add in this other factor of increased demand by by geese, 
and uh, and they alone could potentially create a drought-like situ situation with the supply food demand curves. Um, and so, um, you know, knowing where to put the water and when on the landscape, and it can become more and more critical with, as we uh, as we have the tools to to kind of get at you know where the limitations might be on the landscape. And um, sort of a proof of concept, we did. Uh, we have done a lot of work um, just measuring birds at uh, hunter check stations. As the hunters come out, we take some uh, morphometric measurements, by, uh, to which we um, developed a, a body condition index um, based on those measurements. And we uh, um, use, uh, in, in that index, we use different species, uh, the sex of the bird, and where they were collected, um, where they were shot. Um, to, co to come up with that index and, and look and see if we can measure that um, body can, or that uh, uh, impact of, uh, potential impact of drought or poor habitat conditions. And what we see, um, it, actually body condition is a, is a nice check of that. And in the 80s, uh, body condition was significantly lower prior to, uh, well, prior to a lot of the, the winter flooding of rice, the joint venture restoration work. Um, uh, body condition in general was 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 um, quite low. It started off okay and just deteriorated through the winter, and um, and actually um, was was quite low by January. And then when we look in the in the 2000s where we had really good conditions, we had a lot of restoration, a lot of flooded rice, no drought. Uh, body condition was really good, um, and the birds uh, more or less maintained um, body condition over winter. Um, but uh, definitely ended up in in, uh, in good condition compared to the uh, the 80s at the end of winter. And then when we look at 2014, which is a drought year, we see um, really a, a similar pattern uh, to what we see in the 2000s, the non-drought. Except um, it's they start off good and they kind of maintain um, for a while, but then the, the slope of decrease uh, of um, body condition. Um, the slope uh, increases downward, and uh, we see a, a sort of an intermediate um, body condition. Still, still significantly greater than it was in the in the 80s, but um, and so not not too bad, and almost you might say almost drought proof uh, potentially, um, but really reliant again on lots of um, rice and those stable habitats uh, provided by uh, um, wetlands uh, for hunting and, and recreation. That are a big part of the habitat component. That are maybe a little bit more drought-proof than, um, say, the agricultural habitats. And then this is just, uh, yeah, more um, reinforcement of that. The, the the slopes of those lines, the the decrease is uh, obviously more significant in pre-joint venture. Um, the drought, um, they started off good, ended up. Uh, uh, not as bad, but uh, uh, not as um, not as good in the non-drought years. So if we get back to that question about drought and waterfowl and winter habitat, and is it drought-proof? And and I think what we see is a trend towards um, you know some some positive numbers and that some indication that the the uh, restoration wetland restoration efforts and the work of the the network of uh, you know private and public lands. Um, supporting waterfowl in the, in the Central Valley are are, are uh, doing a pretty good job, um, but we are still heavily dependent on agriculture, the agricultural landscape, um, and so you know, that um, that can go up and down with economics and, and a variety of other reasons, and, and especially water availability. So, um, you know, uh, drought proof is probably uh, uh, too strong a term for now, and. Uh, yeah, in certain areas like the San Joaquin where we've seen a lot of uh, conversion and we're starting to see more and more conversion to nut crops, a lot of almonds, um, it's, they make a pretty picture, but the waterfowl tend not to uh, get a lot of um, benefits from, from those habitat types. So going forward, we're going to use that water tracker uh, uh, to you know help interpret our waterfowl data and um, we were really impressed that it could be modified to be very highly predictive of waterfowl habitat. Um, the telemetry advancements that are allowing for this regional, local, and pinpoint assessment of waterfowl habitat selection. And um, we know that drought can impact waterfowl, waterfowl habitat quantity and quality. And um, we can 
actually uh, use the water tracker to really um, even uh, further define where and when those effects are taking place and really help guide and steer management, uh, and which really leads to the, to the bottom line of the more we can understand how our water use decisions can affect waterfowl populations, we can help improve conservation and uh, recre recreational opportunities into the future. So um, that's, uh, uh, I think it's a, it's a promising outlook, and I, I'd like to thank all of our collaborators and funding partners, the uh, Southwest Climate Adaption Science Center for kind of uh, letting us pull these, these two uh, kind of disparate sources of information together and work together as a collaborative team, and I think it was really uh, a great benefit. And um, then, you know, from Fish and Wildlife Service and USGS, our major funding for, the, for the, uh, um, the telemetry work was through the California Department of Water Resources, and then uh, uh, and a lot of uh, help from our um, private uh, landowners in the Sassoon Marsh where we uh, caught most of our birds. So uh, with that, I'm not sure where we are time-wise. It seemed like it went fast. I'd like to thank Mike. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Elda and everybody over at uh, USGS uh, that continue uh, helping us put on this webinar. And it looks like we actually have one person showing up right now. Uh, I think it's Liana. I'll actually unmute you right now. Uh, Liana, you should be on the line. Hi there. Yeah, this is Liana out at uh, Fort Irwin. Um, we're up in the desert, so we don't have a tremendous waterfowl management program, but thanks for this presentation. But we do, however, put transmitters on lots of different types of birds, so I just wanted to find out the reasoning for putting the transmitters on geese on the neck as opposed to the backpack type. Yeah, uh, there's been a lot of research on uh, attachment type for geese. There's been a lot of um, over the years. Um, and I think the geese just, they tend to, with the backpack, they, um, and we've, we've done both. Um, we started marking geese in the early 80s with backpacks. Um, and they, they just behaviorally, uh, they have a real hard time. They can, they just are constantly pulling and, and uh, fussing with the backpack. And um, it just, uh, they just don't seem to handle that very well. What we've seen with the, with the collar, um, at least for, we had just uh, great success. Um, we see an adjustment period with no matter what the attachment method, if they make it through the first couple of weeks, um, they're probably going to do really well with, uh, with either one. Uh, just the backpacks just seem to have a lot more issues um, behaviorally with the birds. And these collars are quite light. They're only like, they're 35 grams, the, the goose collars. Uh, the, the duck tra transmitters are like, uh, we're down to 10 gram, uh, 10 to 14 grams on some of the new ones. Um, but the, the goose collar is relatively light for a, for a 3,000 gram bird. Um, they're down around, you know, 35, 35 grams. Um, Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, and we also have a question from Steve Jackson. Jack Jackson, sorry, Steve. Uh, you should be on the line now. Okay, yeah, can you hear me? Yep, I can. Okay, yeah. Uh, hi, Mike. That was that was really interesting. Thanks for, for doing this. Um, I actually have uh, two or three questions. Um, one, I, uh, first was uh, just sort of a general information thing. I was impressed by how few of the Central Valley birds are going up the Pacific coast. They're, they're heading inland, and it looks like their breeding territory is mostly like uh, the prairie potholes region. Is that correct? It looks like they're going to Manitoba and Saskatchewan for the summer. Yeah, in general, I would say um, the, the, the most um, common route that we're seeing for the ducks and the geese, um, and, and not all of them, like the, the mallards and the gadwall that we mark, uh, we're marking bird, those birds on nest in, in California. So, um, so you wouldn't see that migration. If you mark mallards in the wintertime, uh, you'd see that some of those would migrate probably to the prairies as well, but um, just, just to preface that. But yeah, the, um, the primary route has been like through the southern um, Oregon, uh, northeastern California, and then off from there, like up to Malheur area, and then 
headed towards the prairies. We have some, some birds will go straight across uh, Nevada to Salt Lake and then up. Um, but yeah, it's, it, there's not a lot, we're not seeing a lot of coastal migration. And um, we, we're having some birds come back now. Some of the geese actually flew up that interior route. Some of these snow geese flew up through, um, you know, went to Malheur or Summer Lake and then up into the prairies and then hung out around Edmonton until, you know, late April, early May, and then headed up towards the Arctic Circle. And then the, the Wrangell Island birds, you know, were over, you know, northern, you know, an island off the coast of Russia. Uh, and then they came back via a co more coastal route. So we've had a couple that flew, you know, directly over the ocean, um, some down the coast from Vancouver. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's a good observation, Steve. Yeah, yeah, I just found it interesting. It was a little, you know, not, not being a waterfowl person and having learned uh, back in the 70s, uh, you know, the old Frank Bell Rose uh, flyway corridors. And so this was, this is really interesting. I, I want to think about this and maybe discuss it with, uh, with you some more at some point. Um, a second question is, is, it's, it, uh, is there historical information to the effect that the San Joaquin Valley was a more critical, or a, uh, sorry, not critical, um, that's got baggage, but that it was a much more widely used winter habitat before the nut crop conversions? And because uh, I, I think it'd be interesting to document that if with whatever kind of, uh, of data are available. And I guess to, to pin a question onto that, is there risk of the rice fields in the Sacramento Valley undergoing similar conversion because the nut crops are so lucrative? And they're so water intensive, of course, um, you know, there, there's a lot of money being made which is driving a lot of that conversion. And is it possible that that is a potential hazard for uh, the waterfowl habitat over the coming decades? Yeah, that, you hit on it. That's a, that's a, that's a huge concern. Um, you know, agronomics obviously drive what, you know, what's out there and, uh, you know, and then the, the, the growing conditions of the soils and, and, and such. And I think, they, they are finding some farmers are experimenting. You know, the, the common wisdom was that about probably about 70 percent of the of that 550,000 acres of rice is is a really heavy clay uh, soil type. You know, the, it was probably the old um, you know tule marsh from the past, and uh, and it was thought the common wisdom was it couldn't really grow trees. The trees wouldn't do well in that in that soil, and I think what they're finding is that they actually can. So I think, um, you know, conversion is definitely a concern. Luckily, I think rice is still, um, you know, fairly, fairly, you know, the, the economics of rice are still pretty good too. Um, so, but yeah, definitely a concern and we can see it going that way. As far as the San Joaquin Valley, um, you know, I think the San Joaquin Valley saw some initial um, uh, hits to numbers it was kind of the it was kind of a death by well I wouldn't call it um, a million cuts. It was a couple big cuts. One was once they stopped burning rice in the Sacramento Valley and started flooding the rice uh, straw for decomp, it created so much more wetland habitat in the Sacramento Valley that um, it, you know I think the birds never even made it to the San Joaquin Valley. They just short stopped. Um, and then you have you add that to a, just a changing cropscape down there where the Right, the little bit of rice. There was some rice, and there was um, other, you know, uh, crops that you could flood there, you know, for. And there was a lot of pasture um, and cattle ground, and a lot of that cattle ground and pasture ground got converted to vineyards. And and I think those habitats that you know were seasonally flooded. I think the water tracker would pick up a lot of water out on that landscape in the in the winter time. Uh, you know, back in the 90s or 80s when it was you know that pasture or a much more grassland type habitat as opposed to, you know, vineyards and the orchards that are now replacing all that. Um, so it's kind of, it's a combination there where the birds are stopping north. So some of the reduction is probably just not, they're just not going down there. And the other is that then when they do go down there, it's really, they only have the wetland habitats remaining to that. Um, and it's sort of more, much more of a postage stamp uh, habitat down there. Mm -hmm. So that transformation from 
burning the flooding uh, may have offset some of the effects of what was going on further to the south. Um, final question is, um, to what extent are the managers, the, the people who are uh, making the decisions on moving the water around at the refuges and duck clubs and so forth, are they using water tracker at this point? And um, what, you know, kind of what, what's your thinking on how uh, water tracker will can and will be used by um, by the management community in a in a direct way. Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think there's going to be a pretty good. I mean, there's going to be an opportunity to apply it, and I think it will um, you know provide an opportunity for certain groups and certain areas to take advantage of. Because the nice thing I don't maybe I didn't emphasize it too. It's like updated every two weeks. So if you're really interested in what you're, the landscape around, like the, the area that you're working with, looks like, uh, and you want to try and you know f you know make some decisions on how you treat your land in relationship to what's around you, that's a tool that you know that's that's really nice to have. I think the Nature Conservancy is using that uh, to manage some of their lands, especially in the Delta, and, and and some of their yeah they're using that the Rice Returns program that they're trying to. Um, uh, look for opportunities for um, flooding up habitats for shorebirds and, and spreading that habitat out across the landscape. So, so there is a. I know they're using it. And then we've been meeting with uh, you know we meet with the Sacramento Refuge National Wildlife Refuge Complex. We've met with them a couple times, and we showed them some of the you know they didn't really know what was available, and we, we showed them you know their ability to look at at the flooded habitats on a very timely basis, and they were super excited about that and. Um, you know, they were using it kind of in a, in a way I didn't expect. They were using it to, you know, one of the water managers just said, oh, yeah, I, I flooded that unit and I, I drained that unit in, in uh, April. And the biologist was saying, well, that habitat looks like it got drained in February. So he went in and looked at the maps and said, and it was very clear that it actually had been drained early. And so uh, he was able to kind of check what they had written down in their database for management versus what actually took place on the landscape. and. Uh, he thought that was great, so he could uh, kind of check up and make sure that the management uh, matched up to what the outcome was in terms of vegetation. So I, I think it'll, it'll, you know, I think as more and more people become aware of the tool, uh, they'll probably start to use it, and then um, I think it, 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 it'll really be helpful, especially when, you know, as water becomes more and more, um, you know, limited. Uh, where you where you put those resources on the ground, really pretty critical. Yep. Yeah, I'll I'll take this up with you offline or sometime later. But yeah, I'm I'm uh, uh, eager to talk with you about how to accelerate and facilitate that whole process. Yeah, and and Matt Ryder from Point Blue be great to have in on that, obviously, because the 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 water tracker is really like his baby, and and uh, you know we. we we think it's just a, it's a neat combination of combining the bird data and that product to to make to try and make sure that it's useful and and uh, it's it's actually predicting what we think it's predicting. So um, thank you again for uh, attending and thank you, Mike, for the presentation and thank you to uh, USGS and ELDA for continuing this series. Thanks very much.